if I could write JavaScript every day, uh, actually, no, I, I probably wouldn't want to do that. But if I could write TypeScript every day, I think I'd love that. I really like TypeScript. But what I've realized is that when I'm writing TypeScript, I'm usually working with Node. And I've been writing a lot of Go over the past couple of years and a little bit of Rust. And what that's taught me is that I really appreciate when my language has tooling for things like formatting, linting, uh, test running, um, building an executable, those type of things. And Node just kind of falls short in that aspect. I say falls short, I think it's a design decision, but it's a design decision that falls short with me. Bun gets a little closer. Bun tends to do some of those things, and I have been messing around with Bun for a little while now, and I, I like it. So before I tried Bun, though, I tried this thing called Dino. Uh, so Dino is built by Ryan Dahl, the original, one of the original uh, maintainers of uh, Node.js. Um, and basically, it's his approach at tackling the same problem again, knowing what he knows now. So given what Node did right, given what Node did wrong, in his opinion, uh, trying to rebuild it and um, with, with a different purpose. Or, I'm sorry, with the same purpose, but with a different uh, path. And it's interesting. <laughs> I, um, I tried Dino a while back and did not care for it uh, originally. It felt kind of complicated uh, in ways that seemed really foreign. So, for example, um, when you import external modules, you import them via a uh, path, like a URL path. And what I saw was um, it was really hard to manage your dependencies. It was hard to know what dependencies were being used in a project. And what that meant is uh, as projects started to scale, people would create a TypeScript file called deps.ts and import all of their external dependencies there and re-export them, which just seemed excessive. Um, so one of the things that I'm really excited about with the new Dino 2 release candidate is that they are offering uh, full compatibility with NPM. Uh, so let's see, TypeScript changes, node, API changes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's actually going to be captured in this or not, but they have um, full support for uh, a package JSON and managing that. Um, and you can see, so if your project contains a package JSON, this is important, the if, so you don't necessarily have to use the package JSON if you like the old way that Dino dependencies are being managed. Uh, but if you are choosing to use one, Dino will help manage that as well, which I think is just great. Uh, and then you can see, for example, here's what those imports look like. Um, if you're unfamiliar with JSR, JSR is the JavaScript registry. I actually don't know what it stands for but it's one of the offerings that uh, Dino has. So yeah, JSR.io, open source package registry for modern JavaScript and TypeScript. So we probably should break down Dino into a couple different things. So Dino is a business. Uh, they are, to my knowledge, a for-profit business. Um, Dino is also this uh, JavaScript runtime uh, that supports TypeScript out of the box, which is one of the things I'm most excited about. Uh, and then Dino is also a set of products. So there's that runtime that I mentioned. There's a tool called Dino Deploy. There's a tool called Dino Subhosting. There's a tool called Dino for Enterprise. Um, Dino has a web framework called Fresh. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Um, but I, I guess what I really want to look at today is my opinion on should you look at Dino? Should you consider Dino for your projects? And I have been messing around with the, uh, well, uh, 146.3 for a while now, um, kind of in, in anticipation of this release candidate, actually, or Dino 2. And I've been reading through some of the announcements about the release candidate and some of the things it supports. And I think my takeaway is that, yeah, you probably should look at Dino. I think that this is going to be a pretty big movement in the JavaScript ecosystem. Okay, so we're on Dino.com, so we're on the Dino part itself. Let's crack open these docs. Okay, so uh, you can see if you're new to Dino, this is the place to start, so you can learn the basics. You can learn oops, configuration, so how to customize the built-in TypeScript compiler. Yeah, built-in TypeScript compiler, that's nice. Formatter, that's nice. And linter, that's nice. Specifically, because I start to think about all the dependency headaches that I have in the node world, 
And they usually come into play in a combination of my TypeScript version, my ESLint version, and my Babel version, and, and all of the plugins necessary to make those play nice with each other. So getting uh, plugins in Babel for TypeScript, or uh, you know, plugins in Babel to support ESLint, or whatever type of plugin you have set up. Kind of a pain. So the fact that Dino just takes care of these as built-ins, that's really nice. Uh, it has a built-in test runner, so you don't have to worry about installing something like Jest or uh, VTest or anything like that. Um, I guess testing has gotten so much better in JavaScript over the past couple of years that this one doesn't bother me as much. But when I was installing like Mocha, the Mocha test runner, and Chai, and trying to build test harnesses together with those, this would have been really, really nice. So you have examples here. Um, this, this is actually probably the way that I would recommend learning Dino if you're already familiar with JavaScript or TypeScript and coming from Node. Uh, so like for example, we can take a look at their Hello World. Uh, so this is an HTTP server that serves Hello World. Notice we don't have to install Express. Notice we don't have to uh, reach into Node for some package. Um, it's just Dino serve and then you give it a handler. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, if you're building giant applications, you might want something more than this. But I think what's nice is that Dino gives you a place to start from and you can build into this if you would like. But since it also supports the entire NPM ecosystem as of Dino 2, uh, what you can also do is you can just pull in Express. If you want to use Express, you can just pull it in. Um, I know that I, what I've been working with recently has been SvelteKit and I've been loving it. And I know that there is already work on a SvelteKit uh, adapter for Dino 2 um, in the works, which I think is really exciting. Uh, another really fun one is like WebSockets. So uh, this is kind of cool. This is, I, I don't know if you've done WebSocket stuff in Node before. This is less code. Um, it still seems like a fair amount of code for something like establishing a WebSocket connection. But in the grand scheme of things, this is actually really light and simple. And what you see here is like the things that are different, fundamentally different from Node are prefixed with Dino. They're in the Dino namespace. So you have Dino serve, Dino.upgrade WebSocket. This seems maybe a little strange that the standard library has something for upgrading a WebSocket, but then we start to think about JavaScript and what is JavaScript and what is JavaScript used for? And it, it really makes sense that something like this might exist in the standard library. Uh, examples of adding an event listener to a socket, nothing crazy going on there. Uh, and then, you know, when the socket gets a message, um, sending it back, specifically sending Pong back, sorry. Uh, and then this is really nice. So if you have the Dino, CL, Dino CLI, you can just run this and it'll work. Um, notice like this is a URL. Uh, so Dino run and then you can pass in a URL and execute those URLs. That seems like it could be unsafe, which brings us to this next thing here. So Dino is secure by default. Uh, that's the mentality that they take. And the idea here is if I have code that accesses your network, I have to allow it. So I can either pass this allow net flag, or if I run this without passing in the allow net flag, it will halt execution and prompt me to give you permission, give your script permission to access my network. Same with the file system. Same with, uh, well, there's quite a few others, but let's see if I can find information on security. Um, reading files. I don't see anything, that's wild. Oh yeah, permissions, here we go. It's like, that's wild, that's so important uh, and, and such a big piece of their um, uh, API is like the permission system. Now, this is still not what I'm really looking for, but you can request permissions. You can see if you have access to permissions. Um, and then if uh, you are trying to access certain things, it will it'll prompt for permission. Uh, so one thing that I do like about Dino is they try to reinforce browser APIs where possible, which in theory means that your code can run on Dino or it can run in the web browser. Or the inverse is true. You could write code in the web browser and bring it over to Dino and expect it to run as you would expect. Uh, so if you are curious more about the APIs that they support, you can see like how Dino supports Canvas. It's kind of interesting. Um, or how Dino supports cache, fetch, streams, URL, anything like that. Uh, let's see what else. There's uh, information for Dino Cloud in particular. Um, so I 
think this, I actually don't know much about this module. I would need to check this out, but my hunch is that this is based around Dino Deploy. Um, and then I guess on that note, you can see Dino deploys down here. So uh, you can see what compromises that product offering. Again, this is Dino deploys their Dino based hosting that Dino, the company does. Um, but they have a key value database built into the Dino runtime with a simple API. It works with zero configuration on Dino deploy. This is really nice. So you can build a product locally with key value database and then um, just push that to Dino Deploy and you'll have a key value database that is production ready uh, on Dino Deploy that your code hooks into. Crons, uh, executing code on a configurable schedule, um, seems really nice. I've been doing that in SvelteKit. It was a bit of a pain, but it involved an external dependency. Um, but yeah, having that built in seems really nice. And then queues, um, what to say about queues. If you are working with distributed systems uh, pretty regularly, you're probably quite familiar with queues. And if you're not, you will probably become very familiar with queues over the next five or 10 years. Uh, so I, I think this is great. I like that there's built-in support. Um, and again, maybe this is my experience with Go shining here in JavaScript land as well. The node purists might tell me that queues shouldn't really be something that is uh, part of the runtime API. Um, so again, despite this being a part of Dino Deploy, there's an API for queuing. And that, like in production, will use the queues on Dino Deploy, but there's an API for working with it, whether you're using Dino Deploy or not. Um, but I guess the point I'm getting at is the, the node purists might say, like, you should install a library for that that shouldn't be part of the standard library. But I'm here to write software, and uh, yeah, if I'm working with queues, it kind of makes sense for queues to be a part of the standard library, especially given how relevant they have become in distributed systems. Um, Subhosting is another platform that they have. Uh, I don't know a ton about this yet. It allows, it's a platform designed to allow software as a service providers to securely run code written by their customers. That sounds nice. Not entirely sure how I'd want to use that outside of like letting people execute scripts and get the output. Um, but yeah, seems nice as well. Uh, so you can try Dino or Dino deploy here, um, and kind of get started with it. I do, let's see, there's one more thing. Let's see. So Dino has a standard library. Uh, one of the things that I like is that they're very transparent about, um, where things run. And then also they have a package score that they use uh, to determine the quality of that package. Um, so for example, standard archive runs on Dino, only Dino, and it has a 94 score, which is pretty good, but it's also deprecated and it tells you to use standard tar instead. So I'm curious, can we find that? Where is tar? Right here, unstable, streaming utilities for working with tar archives, only runs on Dino 94, probably a copy of the same package, at least at the start just based off the fact that it runs in the same and has the same score. But yeah, uh, so they have a package for working with TOML files. That's nice. You can also see that it works in all browsers. So Firefox, Chrome, Safari, all major browsers, I should say, um, and probably works fine in Opera and everything too. I, but these are the ones that they are agreeing to support. Um, this works in Bun, which is pretty cool. It works in Dino. And it works in Node, which is pretty slick. So even if you don't choose to use Dino, you can still use some of the packages from the Dino standard library. Um, and then also the last one over here is Cloudflare Workers. Uh, they're becoming more and more prevalent, so it's nice to know that things are running on those as well. Uh, but yeah, this is essentially the standard library, so you can see that it has support for UUIDs, ULIDs, web GPUs, YAML, text, testing, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but the nice thing here is that the standard library feels kind of rich. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, yeah, okay, this is the page I was looking for. So I've kind of already gone over this, but um, modern Node.js projects will run in Dino with little to no reworking required. This is huge. Uh, however, there are some key differences between the two runtimes that you can take advantage of to make the code simpler and smaller when migrating to your Node.js, migrating your Node.js projects to Dino. If you want to go through that, uh, you can find all that information here. The thing that I found that was really nice is this Node to Dino cheat sheet. So if you're used to running uh, node file JS, it's Dino file JS. TS node file TS is just Dino here. 
Uh, no need for Nodemon or uh, no demon, however you pronounce this. I've always referred to it as Nodemon. Um, you can just use Dino Run Watch um, instead of Node E, Dino Eval. Uh, yeah, you get the point. You can look at this on your own time. You don't need me to walk you through every single one of these. Um, but the, the point being, like, if you start to see all these other packages on the left, and then you look at them on the right, they're just subcommands for Dino. Like this stuff's all built in and that's so nice in my opinion. Also the security and permissions piece, this is the piece I was looking for about security and permissions. So you can see an example, allow reads. Um, basically it's allow and then permission when running a script. So you can see Dino run allow reads. Uh, you can deny certain permissions. So I can choose to allow net but deny network for example.com, uh, which is kind of wild. Um, but yeah, you can, you can dig into this on your own if you'd like as well. Uh, and then if you choose to do web development, I want to pull up uh, Dino Fresh. Uh, so the Dino team has a front end. Uh, I shouldn't necessarily say front end because I don't know if it's just front end anymore, um, but a, a web framework uh, called Fresh. Um, it looks nice. It's very similar to what you are probably familiar with. Uh, so much in fact that this little icon right here makes me think of what they're trying to convey, which would be react. Um, so fresh routes are dynamically server rendered. So yes, it's not client side only, uh, preact components. So there's zero JavaScript shipped to the browser by default. That's extra nice. Uh, simple to write fast to run. So you can see, here's an example of what a page might look like. Uh, it uses an island-based architecture similar to what you get in Astro, which is nice. So it ships plain HTML, then hydrates the JavaScript only where it's needed. Uh, with Preact, you get best-in-class performance plus the convenience of signals. Uh, example of how forms are handled. Um, they say the right way. Um, don't fight the browser. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Uh, this is kind of what SvelteKit does. Um, Maybe not exactly like this, but choosing to use forms the way that the browser intended, so you're not fighting the browser and you're just leveraging the browser for its strengths. Uh, the ability to stream HTML straight from the server, all sorts of fun little things. Uh, so you can see uh, deco.cx is uh, using Fresh. There's some other applications that are using Fresh. You might be able to find those here. Um, but if you want to get started and try this out for yourself, you can try it out again. If you've worked with React or Preact, um, this is going to be cake. I think the main thing will be just re remembering that you need to use Dino commands, or you might not even need to use Dino commands, but you want to use Dino commands instead of node commands when uh, running your project or running tests or things of that nature. Um, so I think that's really just about it. I just wanted to mention this and put this on your radars because with Dino 2 coming out, I'm really excited about the future for TypeScript. Uh, and making TypeScript a first-class citizen as a part of the development experience um, as far as runtimes go. And I'm hoping that, honestly, it, it gives me more of an excuse to write more TypeScript because the language itself is fantastic, but the tooling has always been subpar when compared to other modern languages like Go and Rust. Um, and I feel like Dino is really taking a step forward to bring the tooling up to the standards that I would expect from a modern platform. So what are your thoughts on Dino? Are you excited to try it? You think it's a bad idea? You sticking with bun? You're gonna do node? You got so many options. Let me know in the comments below.